All right, thank you, and good afternoon. Um, so uh, I haven't been here all day to hear all of your conversations, but uh, I hope that this will kind of serve as a, as a thought-provoking capstone to the discussion you've had um, in this morning. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with ENO, uh, ENO is a 94-year-old transportation policy think tank. We're based right across the circle on, at uh, Rhode Island Avenue. And Mr. Eno was a traffic pioneer who has claimed to have invented the stop sign, but we've never been able to confirm that. Um, <laughs> so what we do know is that he invented the hard left turn. For those of you who enjoy making left turns, you can thank Mr. Eno. Uh, before Mr. Eno, apparently people just went, and now we pull into the intersection and turn left. So uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, so now what we do is we work on transportation policy issues across all modes of transportation, and we do things like uh, an, an original research, which is what I'm going to share some of, which, some of you today, and we also do courses, and we do courses across a number of subject areas, most, most prominently in public transit, but we also uh, have courses in P3, which is something I've heard came up a lot today, so, uh, and we have a project on P3. So that, I'm not here to talk about P3, but if you're interested, Talk to me later and we can, we can talk about it. So what I am going to talk about today is our report that we issued last year, which is called How We Pay for Transportation, the Life and Death of the Highway Trust Fund. Um, that paper is available on our website and I encourage you to read it if you have not uh, already done so. And the paper addresses the overall crisis in transportation uh, policy in this country at the federal level. Um, and I think that that crisis is best summed up by the old joke about uh, uh, two ladies having dinner and one turns to the other and says, uh, this food is terrible, and the other one says, uh, yes, and such small portions. It is very <laughs> similar. Uh, we've got only two problems with the Federal Surface Transportation Program. We don't have enough money and we're not spending it very well. Um, and so those two problems are often thought of separately. So for example, my work at the Bipartisan Policy Center was, was mentioned. There we worked on, all right, how do we spend this money more effectively? And then there's been a ton of work on, well, how do we raise more money for, for, for transportation? And what we did is we said, well, these things are actually directly related. And how you raise the money determines how you spend the money. Because in the political world that is Capitol Hill, where the money comes from has a tremendous influence on where it goes to. Uh, and so you can't really look at these two things separately. And so we said perhaps the problem is that we need to look at these two things together and figure out why it is that we don't have enough money and why it is that we're not spending it very well and perhaps that if we try to solve both of these things at the same time we might get somewhere. And the way to solve them of course is to think differently about how we spend the money. Now you're all, uh, about how we raise the money, I'm sorry. You're all familiar with how we raise money currently under the federal program. We have a, a gas tax, uh, diesel and a regular gas tax that fund a highway trust fund that funds both highways and mass transit. Uh, and that's been the structure that's essentially been in place with varying degrees of, uh, of changes and successes and failures since 1956. Um, the reason we don't have enough money, uh, uh, there, there are two issues behind not having enough money, and one has probably already been discussed today, maybe the other hasn't. I'm sure you discussed the fact that we're underinvesting in our infrastructure. There's been a number of studies confirming the fact that we are well behind, we're losing economic competitiveness, and I'm not talking about the American Society of Civil Engineers study that gives us a D minus every year, uh, which is, yeah, I, that's, that's great and that's wonderful that they do that work, but as someone else pointed out to me, what, if we get a D minus, what is Somalia getting? I just hard to understand how we have a D minus, but, but let's assume that we are under investing because that's clear. Uh, we, we can see that in the fact that, in the most prominent way, because the um, gap we keeps getting larger. In other words, the, the amount of the deficit that we have in backlogs of investment keeps getting larger. You see transit agencies around the country which have billions of dollars in debt. You see transportation agencies around the country with serious debt problems. It's because they're not, they don't even have enough money to take care of what they have effectively. And that's one thing. We don't have enough money from that perspective, but we also don't have enough money from a political perspective to get a bill passed. I mean, you have to have a certain amount of money available to spread around to everybody in order to get a bill through Congress. And we don't have that, which is why we've been unable to get a long-term transportation bill um, since uh, essentially 2005. And then there's the premise that you also need to accept in order to understand and, and appreciate what I'm going to say today, which is that we're not spending that money effectively. Most of that money is going out by formulas to states 
you know, it's important to remember that states own and operate the highway system uh, in this country. The federal government provides a substantial share of funding, about 45 percent of the capital funding for highways and transit in this country, but they are owned and operated by states and localities. Um, and the federal government doles out about 92 percent of that money through formulas with very little accountability for how that money is actually spent. That doesn't mean states and localities don't make good decisions. Some of them do, some of them don't. Some have good processes in place, some don't. But there's no accountability at the federal level to ensure that that money is being spent in a way that furthers any kind of national goals or, or federal policy. And so why do it then? If you're, what's the point of having a federal program if all you're doing is just collecting the money and giving it back to the states? So the, lo the, the logical solution to this and, uh, that, that usually comes up is, well, okay, we, we're not collecting enough money, and so why don't we just raise the gas tax, and then we'll have enough money, and we can go back to having a big federal program. And perhaps we can introduce some accountability that way. And there are some issues with that. Um, number one being, we've been trying to raise the gas tax unsuccessfully for over two decades. Um, we, we've, the last one was in 1993, and that one was not for the purposes of transportation. Neither the was one in 1990, and in fact, it's been since the early 80s, when 1982 was the last time we increased the gas tax in this country for the purposes of investing in transportation. It's important to remember that. And so banging our heads against the wall saying we should raise the gas tax, no matter how logical, no matter how reasonable that might be, is a political challenge that evidence shows is pretty much insurmountable. Uh, and there's always hope, and there's always a, a, a possibility, but uh, there's not really political support for doing that. And there, there are a number of reasons for that I'm not going to go into today. But you have to accept the premise that if we're, we realize that raising the gas tax is not happening, perhaps we should start thinking about another way to do this from a funding perspective. And that perhaps we could think of a way to do this that creates some kind of accountability, or at least enhances the ability to have accountability. Because right now, under the gas tax structure, it's very difficult to introduce accountability into the system, because what you've got is states saying, well, I put in X amount of money, therefore I should get X amount of money back, and demanding that the rate of return be at least 95 percent on the percentage of gas taxes that they're giving to the, to the federal government. And when you have that level of return, it's very difficult to allocate resources in the most effective manner. Also, because the money is coming from the users of the system, who are primarily highway users, uh, it is very difficult to use that money on things that are not highways. Now, there has been a portion dedicated to mass transit uh, for many, many years now, but it's almost like that is set in stone and cannot possibly be changed under penalty of death because it's a, co it's a collaboration and an agreement that is tentative uh, between the highways and transit. Like, okay, we're all in this together, so we'll split it up 80-20. That is not actually how we want to allocate resources. We want to do it based on where we might get the economic returns, where we might get returns on safety, environment, other goals we might have for transportation, not satisfying the constituencies that are getting the money. So with that in mind, we asked two questions. First of all, why is it that we haven't seriously considered moving away from the existing funding structure in this country? And two, what do other countries do? That both seem like very reasonable questions. Uh, you know, if the current structure is not working and it's failing us, we should think about other possibilities. And perhaps some other countries are doing things that might be useful for us to learn from. I know that's not a very American concept, but we <laughs> like to think about uh, how we might learn from others. So the first thing we did was to say, OK, well, what are the barriers to changing the existing structure? Because the existing structure has been in place for a long time. If it were easy to change, then perhaps somebody would have addressed it. No one's even proposing it. I'm sure you heard from Earl Blumenauer earlier today. I'm sure he did not propose to dismantling the entire system. He probably proposed what he usually talks about, which is a gas tax increase followed by a transition to vehicle miles traveled fee, which basically keeps in place the existing user fee trust fund structure. And the user fee trust fund structure may very well be the problem here, because the user fee trust fund structure is what's making it hard to raise the money, because it's a user fee and how to spend the money, because there's a trust fund. So this is saying, well, what are the barriers preventing us from moving away? Well, we identified three primary barriers. One is Congress itself, uh, and not just in the sense that Congress doesn't do anything, but in the sense that Congress's committee structure is set up in a way that incentivizes maintaining the current system. Uh, the authorizing committees in Congress for the Federal Surface Transportation Bill enjoy having power over how the money is spent, and that power comes from the fact that there's a trust fund. 
If you do not have a trust fund, you do not get to have an authorizing committee that decides where the money goes. Instead, like most programs, the authorizing committees may set guidelines, but the appropriators are ultimately deciding how the money gets spent. In transportation, so on the Senate's Environment and Public Works, as well as the Banking Committee, on the House side, it's the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Those committees have tremendous jurisdiction over an enormous pot of money. And that's why when there used to be earmarks and when there used to be money, everybody wanted to be on those committees because they could bring home money to their districts and that would help with their reelection. They often put freshmen on those committees. They put a freshman senator that I was working for on that committee for the same reason. So there are a lot of uh, incentives in place for the authorizing committees to maintain that control. Um, and maintain the user pay trust fund structure. That's why you'll never hear James Inhofe, who's the chair of the, how, of, the, of the Senate Environment Public Works Committee, come out and say, maybe we should get rid of the trust fund. Because if he say, gets rid of the trust fund, he loses the power that he has over distributing that money. So why would he say that? Um, and, and similarly, you're not going to see uh, Bill Schuster say that, who was the chair of the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee in, in the House. And the appropriators, on the other hand, are not particularly eager to seize this power either. It's not like the appropriators are saying, oh, that'd be great, we could allocate the money. They don't want to really necessarily have that much to do with it. They, are, they have tussled with the uh, authorizers in, in previous bills uh, about who gets to say what over which types of money, but they're not clamoring to take responsibility for this. So you've got, uh, you've got that problem. Um, and a second problem is that people in Congress while they might make statements about accountability, accountability for how the money is spent is really not their priority. Having worked for someone in Congress, I can tell you that our priority was how much money does New York get, obviously, was representing New York, <laughs> and which projects are getting the money in New York. Those are the two things we were going to care about. Now, that doesn't mean we couldn't do other things around the margins about how to improve the, the system, but, but accountability is not what they're, they're not thinking uh, you know, how do we make sure we, we provide a great return on investment for the money that's spent? They're thinking, can we just get the money out the door? How do we do this? You know, it's, we have enough problems before worrying about accountability. So it's not going to be a priority for them. So that's one barrier to change. Second barrier to change, the stakeholders themselves. This is a stakeholder-driven program. So the state DOTs, the transit agencies, the MPOs, these are all stakeholders who are getting money from the federal government under this program. And so from their perspective, they would much rather try to continue to hope that they can increase the gas tax and keep the trust fund structure, which separates money out for them specifically in the federal budget that they're guaranteed to get, than take their chances and move away from that structure and have to compete with other priorities. And so for that reason, the stakeholders are always going to be reluctant, even in the face of declining revenues, right, which is what we have now in the gas tax. The gas tax has lost its purchasing power. This is probably, you probably went over this earlier today. You know, it, we're, we're collecting less because people are driving less on a per capita basis, cars are becoming more fuel efficient, and the gas tax has not been increased or indexed for inflation. So we don't have enough money, and they would rather hang on to that sinking ship than lose what at least they know they're going to get. And right now they know they're going to get this dwindling pot of money, and they would rather get that than have to take their chances competing with others. And stakeholders, similar to Congress, accountability is not going to be a top priority for them because they are the stakeholders who are getting the money. And so they think they know how to spend the money. And they don't really want the federal government telling them how to spend the money or, or holding them accountable for how they spend that money. They would much prefer to be able to make those decisions completely independent of the federal government, which is why you see calls from places like AASHTO, uh, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, for, you know, let's increase the gas tax at the federal level, but keep the federal government out of how the states spend the money. And those positions are understandable for a stakeholder to have, but they're not necessarily compatible with a national transportation policy that accomplishes specific goals rather than just gives money out to states. So the stakeholders are a second problem. And then a third problem we identified is the economic theory problem, which is what we, we call it, which is that in, a, in economics there's this theory of user pay and that the concept of having users pay for what they are getting in a uh, government structure makes a lot of sense. And there are three justifications for this. One, when users pay, that sends a signal to them about use. So if you have to pay a higher price, then you say, oh, maybe I'll use that less because it costs me too much. Or if it's a low price, you use it more. And then it also is supposed to say, well, this is how much money is collected from users, so we shouldn't spend any more or less than that. That's how much we should spend. That creates a ceiling and a floor on spending by using user fees. And then third is that user fees are supposed to be a more equitable system 
of collecting money because you pay, you benefit. So each of these three things in theory falls apart in practice when you look at our federal transportation program over the last several decades because it's not sending a signal to users. Do you, anyone know what our federal gas tax is? It's 18.4 cents a gallon. Do you think that 18.4 cents a gallon is sending a signal to users when they are paying uh, a gas price that fluctuates between $3 and $5 a gallon in a given year? Probably not. So it's not sending a signal to users about how much to spend. Um, and it's not, uh, therefore, when it goes, when the price of, uh, when the gas tax, if the gas tax were to be increased even 10 cents, 20 cents, it wouldn't really impact how much we use gas. So it's not functioning in that sense. A ceiling and a floor, it's not working that way either because if we are, right now we've been spending more than we're taking in in gas tax revenues on transportation over the last several years because we've bailed out the highway trust fund several times since 2008 with general fund revenues. So it's certainly not acting as a ceiling on spending. And it hasn't in the past acted as a floor on spending either because we've transferred money away from gas taxes towards other things like deficit reduction in the past. So in practice, it has not served as a ceiling and a floor on spending. And then third is this concept of equity and that users pay and users benefit and that therefore that should work. But that falls apart too because everybody benefits from transportation. It's not just the users who are benefiting and that's the problem that we get into with the highway versus transit debate is that Highway users benefit from people using transit because they're not clogging up the highways. And people benefit from the fact that goods can get to them more efficiently who are not necessarily driving anywhere or buying gas. So the connection between user pay and user benefit is very weak in this case and is not holding up under scrutiny. So the equity concern um, also fades away. So we got Congress who's going to oppose it. We got stakeholders who are going to oppose it. And we've got economic theory um, that are, that's kind of stands in opposition to, to this major, potential major change. And in our judgment, none of those are good reasons to not change. Uh, all those are just reasons why we haven't. Um, and so we said, okay, what is it that uh, we might look to, or what, what, who what might we look to for a different structure? What do other countries do? Um, how might we learn from their structures in order to inform what we do in this country? And we did a scan of uh, national uh, governments and looked at where, you know, where, where are places that are similar. Went through a long peer selection process, which I won't bore you with, but we came up with five countries that we felt were most reasonable to look at, and those were Australia, Canada, Germany, Japan, and the United Kingdom. And those, looking at those peer countries, we wanted to say, okay, first of all, how do they pay for transportation at the national level? And secondly, how do they ensure sustainability of that funding? because that's a critical problem we're wrestling with. And third, how do they make sure that they're uh, able to guarantee money in advance? Because one of the complaints you hear if you talk to stakeholders and you say, well, we should get rid of the trust fund, it's not helping anymore, they might say, well, if you do that, how will you know how much money you're getting in three to five years because you don't have a trust fund? Which, of course, no one knows how much money they're getting in three to five years now, but, <laughs> but the point is that, you can, that transportation is a long-term commitment of funding. So you need to have some sense of what you're going to get in the next five to 10 years in order to make investment decisions now, because it's a long-term investment. And so there's some rationale for wanting to have uh, some uh, certainty with respect to funding. So in looking at those things, uh, the, the bottom, I mean, I'm not going to go through each uh, detail of all these countries, and you can read more about it in the report. But there are three kind of bottom lines um, in, with these five peer countries. In terms of spending, they are either on par or exceeding our spending on a per capita basis on transportation. So the argument that sometimes gets made by stakeholders could be, well, if we moved and had to compete with other funding, with, you know, we had to compete with uh, orphans and, uh, and the elderly, we're going to lose, so we shouldn't go in to compete with them. And if you look at how other countries are doing this, they, um, most of them are, will have those competitions, and transportation still gets funded. And in fact, it gets funded at a higher level in most cases than, than we do in the United States. Now, it's very difficult to assess that. And so I'm not saying that it's clear that we're underinvesting compared to our peers. We're investing more or less in line with some of our peers and less than others. But it is, one thing is clear is we're not doing way better than them because we have a trust fund structure. At a minimum, we're doing maybe as well. But we're not doing necessarily a great job of investing in our transportation system compared to our peers. And in all of these countries, what you see are higher gas taxes by far, I mean, on orders of magnitude higher, 
uh, except for Canada, which we, had, we met some folks from Canada recently had a workshop on this topic. And they didn't remember what their gas tax was, which I thought was interesting. And, and I, I think the reason they didn't know what it was is because these were transportation people, and the gas tax has nothing to do with how they fund transportation, so they weren't uh, necessarily thinking about it. Um, but outside of Canada, all the other countries have much higher gas taxes. We're talking about dollars and dollars per gallon. And none of them use those gas taxes to fund transportation. All of them, their gas taxes go into general revenues. And in every case, they use general revenues to pay for transportation, not gas taxes. And so what you're seeing is a much greater portion of money being collected from the transportation industry. And I, while, while they're spending more or less in line with us, or you know, sometimes in some cases a lot more than us, it's not because they're collecting that money. They're choosing to do that independent of how much money they're collecting from transportation. They're just saying transportation is the priority and this is how much money it gets. Um, what we found is that they all have ways of ensuring multi-year funding. They all have some combination of formula and discretionary programs like we do. Um, in some cases, they use multi-year appropriations processes. In some cases, they have five-year plans, 10-year plans at the national level that they're going to guarantee funding for. Um, but in every case, they've managed to figure this out. It's not rocket science that to, you could potentially have a transportation program without a, a trust fund user pay structure. Um, a couple of interesting anecdotes. Japan, uh, in, until 2009, had a trust fund structure exactly like ours. And in 2009, they dissolved it because it wasn't working well anymore. And it was, it out, it, they, they used it to build the equivalent of their interstate system. The system was complete, and they shut it down. I think that's an interesting lesson for us because this was a great way to build an interstate system. It worked very effectively for that purpose, but that system is complete. Um, and then a, another interesting anecdote was uh, Germany where they created a system of tolls for trucks. They have a, a vehicle miles traveled fee effect effectively on trucks. And they used that money to fund transportation. And what happened? Well, the trucks objected because they said, well, this is truck money. It should be spent on highways, and some of it was being spent on rail. And so they had to get rid of that program as it was and instead turn all that money back into highways. And I think that's another interesting lesson for us because anytime you try to take money from one mode and give it to another mode, you're in trouble. And it's very difficult to do that, and you keep banging your head against the wall trying to figure out how to do that when, in fact, if you have general funds, you can spend them on whatever priorities you want without regard to mode because no one owns that money. And in fact, that's how other countries do it, and that's how they are more successful. And in fact, that's how this country has been more successful. If you look at the programs at the federal level that are funded with general funds, those are the programs that have the most accountability for how the money is spent, and those are the programs that tend to be the most multimodal. For example, you may, may be familiar with the TIGER program, which was under the stimulus bill, a program that sets aside grants for projects of any mode uh, to be evaluated on a cost-benefit basis by the Federal Department of Transportation. And that money has been allocated much more effectively than typical formula money towards much more innovative projects. It's a very small pot of money, but it's been used quite effectively. Similarly, there's a project, a program called New Starts that allocates new money for new transit initiatives. That program is funded by general fund revenues. And because that program is funded by general fund revenues, they're able to use it on more than just one mode, and it has become a very popular and very effective program providing new transit starts all across the country for several decades. So what does all this mean? Let me, let me sum up the kind of key takeaways from this analysis. The current trust fund user pay structure is not working. It gets self-evident. Uh, we, we don't have enough money, we're not spending it effectively. Congress and stakeholders want to prohibit a change away, but they have diminishing incentives to, uh, to, to prohibit a change. And the reason they have diminishing incentives is that there's such a crisis all the time. Congress is sick of bailing out the Highway Trust Fund, believe me. They don't want to have to do it again, and they have to do it every year now, and the hole keeps getting worse. So they need a solution, and they don't agree on raising the gas tax, so they're looking for something else to do. And the stakeholders are starting to realize Maybe we, we're letting this all slip away by holding on to this dwindling pot of money. So Congress and stakeholders are coming along with the idea of something different. Um, the user pay trust fund structure is not working in practice at the federal level, even though in economic theory it might be a good idea. It's actually not working very well. Other countries fund sustainable uh, transportation programs at comparable levels with better accountability for how that money is spent, and none of them use a trust fund. I think that tells us something 
at least, about what we should think about doing. Uh, and so we said, you know, perhaps it's time to kind of wipe the slate clean, think about different alternatives beyond what we've thought about in the past. And we proposed three different possible outcomes. One, you could adjust spending to meet revenues. So if, if you can't accomplish the larger transfer, the larger shift, which seems logical at this point, but if you can't do it, at least mm -hmm. spend only what you're collecting. Because if you keep spending more than you're collecting, you don't provide any certainty for the grantees. So grantees don't really know how much money they're spending. You could at least solve that problem if you said, all right, we're going to only spend what we're collecting in gas tax revenues. Uh, I, I'm not recommending that because it would mean a reduction in the amount of investment in transportation. But it still might be better than what we have today because then states and localities would have some certainty and they could try to raise their own revenue to replace what's lost with certainty that they know they're not going to get that, that money from the feds. A second approach could be a hybrid where we can maintain the trust fund structure with user pay and then we add, augment that with general fund revenues, which is what we've been doing since 2008. We're just not admitting it to ourselves. So it's kind of like, it just let's do what we're doing, but say we're going to do it so everyone knows we're going to do it and be explicit about it. The problem is we're taking that general fund money right now and plugging it back into the same broken system that distributes it without regard to accountability. And if we actually consciously made this decision, as opposed to unconsciously, which is how Congress has done it, then you could allocate that general fund money more effectively and use it to further national goals. So another approach could be do what we're doing, some portion user fees, some portion general fund, just spend the general fund money better and commit to using that general fund money. And then finally, the third approach would be full bore, get rid of the highway trust fund and move on to how most other countries fund their transportation systems, which is uh, let's have uh, a generally funded transportation program with strong accountability for national goals that we want to achieve with that program. Seems like a very logical, reasonable thing to do. It's also a tremendously difficult thing to do. But what we're saying with this report and what we've been trying to get people to realize is it's at least worth considering it. It should be on the table. We should be having the conversation about what the implications of moving to that structure might be. Because the current structure is not working, and we can't keep banging our heads against the wall. That's the, the number one rule, right? If you're digging a hole or banging your head against the wall, is the first thing you've got to do is stop. And then you move on to solutions. So with that, um, I thank you for letting me uh, talk to you today, and I'm happy to take questions. to kind of move to, hello, is that working? Okay, yep. you said it was incredibly difficult to move. So, so how would you propose getting there? Well, I think the answer is to convince Cong the committees in Congress that would benefit and the, the stakeholders that would benefit that there's a reason to do this. I'll give you a couple examples. In Congress, the appropriators have been generally reluctant to take this on because they don't want to have a huge fight with their colleagues about how to spend this money. But if you found enough appropriators who thought that this was a good use of their time and that in fact the Transportation Subcommittee on the Appropriations Committees should be in charge of deciding how much money should be spent, you might be able to start something of a revolution in Congress about this. And then on the stakeholder side, there are many stakeholders that would benefit from a system that actually allocated money according to national goals as opposed to the way it allocates it today. I mean, se several things spring to mind. I mean, number one is that we're not spending um, the money that we have, nearly enough of it, in large metropolitan regions, improving accessibility within those regions. Right now, the money is heavily biased in terms of where it goes towards the rural areas because you have to buy those folks off in order to get the bill passed, which is fine. That's, that's how things work in politics. But they get way more than they, should, they would get based on how the money would be spent in line with national goals because of the user fee trust fund structure that also ensures they get back how X amount that they pay in. So there are a number of stakeholders who could potentially benefit from a more rational allocation of resources. And it's our job to convince them to let go of what they know they're going to get and throw their hat in the ring for what they might get.